Hi, everyone. Just waiting for Anjay to join me on the stage. Perfect. There we go. Good afternoon, Anjay. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Um, just to welcome you all, this is a Gamifiers meetup group um, online, obviously. Uh, <laughs> feel free to join any of the meetup groups around gamification. I like that. Are you? Ah, oh, it's adjusting. No, that's, that's me. It's, it's not you. <laughs> keeping us on our toes. Uh, so the format is, as always, I'm going to ask Anjay some questions I've got for him about his book and other stuff. Uh, but feel free to add questions to the chat. And as I spot them, I will add them to, uh, to our conversation. Or I will uh, add, we'll have a session at the end anyway, where we can ask him Q&A. And at the end of the session, we'll go back to the tables, do a bit of networking, chat to Anjay, because he'll loiter for a bit, yes? I will indeed, yes. Cool. And there's even a table called Jigsaw where you can all do an online jigsaw at the same time and collaborate, which I, you know, I've not tested it here before. So we'll give that a go as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, so to those who don't know, Andrzej Marzuski is, uh, what do we call him? A gamification thought leader, researcher, writer, author, player of games, yeah. guitar player. Yeah. Who is? Who is Anjay? That's why that's what we're doing. I mean, to be honest, I've <laughs> quoted I've quoted Anjay's work in four webinars and workshops in the last week alone, and just encouraged my <laughs> just encouraged my new batch of students to read the book. So uh, I just well, I I guess you did it. So we did matching book covers. I was going to say my my seems to be reversed. Is the only problem with that? <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> What have, what have I missed? Yeah, how would you describe yourself, Angie? Oh, general layabout. Um, no, I think um, these days I'm a gamification solution designer. That's kind of what I'm doing now. Because I think when we first met, I wasn't really doing anything. I was kind of talking about it a lot, writing about it, advising people. Now I'm actually doing it. So hence I've vanished off the face of the earth when it comes to conferences a bit. So I'm, I mean, I'm in that phase where I'm sort of learning learning the best bits of doing stuff rather than sort of just the the, the kind of the theory of it now um but yeah i just i just like games and i, I like sort of introducing the, the world of work into how games can be good for them okay so what i mean where do you work at the moment and what sort of projects are you involved in so i work at a company called motivate um and i'm based in woking uh we have an office in newcastle and one in spain which is the nicest one, obviously. It's warm in Spain. Um, and we're working on anything from loyalty schemes to kind of uh, ones that I'm more involved with around gamification of corporate kind of education, onboarding, that kind of stuff. So uh, there's a couple of case studies on the website. I think I did, I, I talked through one of the case studies a while, but actually possibly in um, Amsterdam uh, about an onboarding um kind of platform we created for a company so um but yeah it's just anything that involves kind of using games to solve problems or what we're working on in the uk especially i think spain's very very sort of focused around loyalty at the moment that's their big okay. one at the moment so yeah it's, it's interesting stuff i like that I mean, you kind of hinted at your journey into gamification can you tell us a <laughs> bit more how did you get into it um I I was writing blogs. I decided I was going to be a blogger, and uh, as I think a lot of people do at some point in their lives, and I was writing about social media. And then something I said, somebody went, "Oh, you you, you might be interested in this guy called um, Gabe Zickerman." And this was about two thousand and eleven, and so I kind of looked at what he was doing, and I thought, "Oh, that sounds similar to what I do anyway," because a lot of I've been a web developer for years before that, and I've developed learning materials. And they'd always been very game-like when I built them, just because that's what I liked. And all of a sudden, there's this guy, Gabe Zickerman, preaching gamification. And you're like, ah, oh, I know what that is. That's exactly what I do. So kind of got into it from there. Um, started off as a bit of a kind of an evangelist, telling everybody they should be doing it and banging the drum a bit, making a lot of mistakes, um, getting a lot of the theory wrong, as we all did at that time, I think. Um, and then... Uh, slowly it started to evolve into an actual job and people wanted to employ somebody who actually knew what they were doing and 
then they wanted to have real roles within their organizations. And I sort of worked at Capgemini for a bit doing some of it because I was there as, the, as their internet manager. Then kind of moved to GTG3, which is part of Capita now, did some stuff there. Worked at Gamification Nation for a little bit and eventually ended up at Motivate doing it. So it's kind of been a bit of a, it's been a long journey. I mean, I sort of started in 2011. I wasn't doing it professionally probably until 2015, 16 doing it sort of as a full-time yeah. thing. So it's, it took a while. Well, that's cool. You had to earn your stripes. Absolutely. I I, I appreciate it all the more that it, I had to work hard for it. <laughs> so you talked about the, the projects Motivator working on. Which ones, what have you been working on recently? What, at Motivate or personally? Oh, wow. Let's just start with Motivate. Um, the last thing that I was building was, uh, funny enough, Going back to the project we spoke about at Amsterdam, we've been doing a big refresh of some of the work on that. So I've been uh, actually designing real games rather than just gamified content. So we wanted just to have some fun stuff in there that kind of signaled the end of certain parts of missions we're doing. So I've actually been in proper game design and working with games developers to try and get some cool stuff. I also... Um, isn't that, uh, isn't that going to confuse your gamification audience? Oh, start don't, designing don't, games as well. Don't. Don't. I've, you know me. I've had this argument for decade, well, for nearly a decade now. You know, games versus gamification, and I've definitely come to the conclusion that just solve the problem. <laughs> it doesn't matter how you solve it; just solve the problem. And in this case, the reason we were doing it was we wanted to have like a big full stop to the end of this big experience you've been doing, and. Um, we just thought actually a proper game they can just enjoy because they've done all the hard work, they've done all the learning, done all the quizzes, done all the tests. So their final moment is a game they can have a bit of fun with, just a sort of puzzle challenge. I've also been working with Newcastle University. I was mentoring a group of seven students there. Um, so I got to design. So they're, they're working on kind of 3D game design and they ask businesses to give them projects and things to do. So I had seven students building me six different versions of the same game just to see what came out of it. So it's like a virtual escape room based on the Woking office. Um, right. And that was really interesting. So mentoring them and kind of helping them design better games was fascinating because the game, again, it was designed as a learning experience. So there were things in the rooms that you could pick up and you'd sort of, you'd look at it, you'll get your clue from it, and then you'll go on and do the next bit. And that was really interesting, kind of integrating proper games with something educational without it feeling a bit like a clash. Because I know we've all done that kind of thing where you bolt, bolt some education onto a game or some games onto education, and they kind of feel a bit at opposed to each other. So we're like we're how we could, often. Yeah, so we're just seeing how we could really integrate it so that you, know, you walk into a room, there'd be a poster on the wall about the company, and on the poster, there'll be a little sort of clue somewhere that you'd have to find to then get the code to unlock the next door. So you'd have to read the information. So you're absorbing the learning whilst also playing the real 3D game. So that was fun. And I said, having having a group of students do it and having six different versions come out was fascinating to see how they all interpreted the brief differently and how there was some really striking similarities. And then there were some things that were just so far apart from each other. So yeah, that's been really good. So it's been, yeah, a lot more actual game design recently, funnily enough. An odd one for my career path. <laughs> I think it's really useful, you know, because we, we borrow from games, don't we? And what works? Mm. You know, I'm intrigued to know out of those six games, which one really struck you? Uh, the one that was the simplest to play because the brief said, this is something that non-gamers will play potentially. So, you know, the idea was, imagine you have this on your website and people can learn about the company. And some got, some of them got really complicated. The puzzles, like I had to ask them for help. I couldn't figure them out at all. This one was really good because you're taking the brief to heart. There were lots of nice puzzles, lots of things you could learn. You didn't have to use really complex controls. So you'd walk towards something and you'd collect it rather than having to sort of find it, get the pixel accurate moment where you click the button and it picks mm -hmm. it up. It just sort of did it for you. So I think from a hitting the brief perspective, that was the best. We had a couple where the graphics just blew my mind for something that could run through a web browser for students who had had a couple of months to build it. So um, hopefully at some point, we'll uh, get some footage out of that and um, kind of let people experience some of what we were doing. But no, it's, I mean, and, and I said, it was more helping the university than us, I think, to some extent. But there's some good stuff comes out of it. You learn a lot from just going through that process of working with people who've not built full games before. You know, they, it's kind of, they've got all the skills, but they haven't necessarily got 
the head around how gameplay works versus just doing what you've been told. So a couple of them, unfortunately, you'd kind of look at it and it's, it did exactly what I wanted it to do, but somehow managed to strip fun away from it. Oh, <laughs> that sounds like a um, good game. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, exactly. So, you know, we, we, there were a few calls where it was like, I love the idea of it, but couldn't you make it fun, please? And they all did it in the end, but it was just that moment of, have I got this wrong somehow? <laughs> so that was, that was really interesting, really interesting. Making yeah, keep going back to it. Make sure it it stays fun. I mean, t talking about fun, I, I, let's do a relevant to the times type question. Uh, how's lockdown affected your work and your day to day life? Have you found yourself gamifying anything like homeschooling or your own? <sighs> do you know what? No, I haven't. Um, I'm the worst person for gamification. I, I it doesn't work on me particularly. It doesn't. It, it, I'm because. I mean, probably like you in some respects, you know enough of it to see it coming and you go, and you're telling other people to do it. And at the same time, you're going, yeah, but I know what this does and the psychology behind that. And you start overanalyzing it. Um, so I haven't specifically used gamification deliberately. Lockdown was fascinating because I've got two children, one's in secondary, one's in primary. And the school's approaches to educating them were very different. So my 13 year old had online lessons, they had videos coming through, they had um, like online assessment tools, which were mm -hmm. games and things like that. And some of those were gamified quite well, actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> my youngest daughter was just once a week given a big worksheet. And that was it, no contact with the school or anything. So with her, it was interesting trying to keep her motivated. Um, she loves school, so that was good. But, you know, by the sort of the second or third month, it was getting a bit tougher. So with her, there were a few incentives being thrown in here and there and trying to make it a bit more interesting. For me personally, I was just really busy. <laughs> you know, so, so we had quite a lot going on. Um, and because the way our company works with remote, we're in remote teams anyway. So it was, it was fairly similar to what I do now, but I played a bit more guitar, really, if I'm being totally honest. The, I was, I was, the room I was working in had all my guitars in it. So that uh, I probably got better at guitar than anything else during that time outside of just doing work work. So that was quite good. I suppose actually, yeah, all right. So yeah, if you talk about gamification, I suppose to some extent I was allowing myself those sort of inspirational moments of I hit a wall, stop, play guitar, come back, get on with stuff. So there's some of that there, I suppose, a bit of autonomy. <laughs> That's cool. Actually, that leads nicely into the next question I had for you. Which Go is, yeah, so I mean, you've got playing guitar, which obviously is big fun for you. But, you know, have you played many games recently? What type of games do you enjoy the most? Do you know, I've actually started playing games again. I'd stopped for a really long time, um, other than stuff I was using for research. So I'd got to that point where I was playing games to do research rather than have fun. Mm -hmm. And um, we got an Xbox uh, One at Christmas. And so the kids have been playing Minecraft on that. And I got Red Dead Redemption 2. So I started playing that. I was really enjoying it. And then we got Xbox Game Pass. So I've played dozens of games recently because you can just download them yeah. off game pass and just carry on with it so at the moment i'm playing crackdown 3 which is great um because i like that free roaming i like to be able to explore and go and do my own thing i would say hence the red uh, dead redemption 2 as well oh absolutely i mean you can just go off and do your own thing for days and, and not see anybody which is quite fun and also it reminds me of westworld i, I love the series westworld and the film so uh, you kind of feel like you're playing that um I, yeah i like free roaming games i like being able to just go off and do what i want um, with the kids, we've been playing, or I've been playing uh, Minecraft Dungeons. That's been quite fun. It's the exact opposite. You know, you've got a really fixed route through everything, but that's been good fun because the three of us can play at the same time on the Xbox. So that's good fun. Playing a lot of Minecraft with the girls. Um, playing board games again as well. We started playing sort of Cluedo and uh, what else we had? We had like this Tetris game, which is a bit like Stap, which has been fun. We got uh, Cards Against Humanity Family Edition. Oh, well, there's a family which, edition. Uh, that sounds a bit safer. No, not so much. No? Uh, only if you, only if mum and dad aren't drinking, because uh, some of the combinations are still. It's still up to your own mind. How, I mean, obviously, there's there's no sort of really evil ones, but there are certain combinations where, you know, my wife and I are just don't bite. Oh god! And the kids are going, what? What? You're like, no, no, no. So my favourite one, something along the lines of, uh, you know, what what does daddy enjoy doing? And then the answer was the babysitter. You know, <laughs> and one of the girl, one of the girls was like, can I put this down? No, you can't. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, it's, it's that that I have done a lot more of during lockdown, and it's kind of reinvigorated a lot of the, the sort of games and my love of games. I think is just playing them again because you know the the kids would be working at be eight thirty in the morning, and I'm not having to drive to work. So obviously, yeah. going oh, I've got half an hour. I know Xbox. <laughs> Very good. I mean, it's good to see that excitement about playing games and not just mm. for research. But in spite of that, how much do you find yourself drawing upon what you've learned in those games in your gamification work? Nonstop, constant. I mean, I, I, my blog today was uh, uh, "What Would Mario Do?" A simple framework for decision making. Basically, do you embrace it or do you avoid it? Because essentially, Mario's entire choices in life are kill it, break it, eat it, or run away from it. <laughs> that's all Mario needs to do in his life. So it's kind of, yeah, I mean, all the time. Not, And it's not just, so game mechanics, I think when you look at gamification, it's hard sometimes to match up kind of game mechanics with gamification because unless you're building 3D worlds, there's, there's a lot of the stuff you'd consider to be game mechanics don't really match across to gamification. But the lessons that you learn about goal setting, task management, time management, time pressure, all that sort of stuff, um, if you don't play the games, you don't really understand the context of how they fit into kind of that bigger picture of what you're trying to achieve at the end. So yeah, I mean, always drawing from games. And I think that's probably, as a gamification designer, the, the best thing you can do is make sure you set aside and side to play games occasionally and just remind yourself what makes them interesting. There's a comment in the chat as well. Since you like open world games, you should try Zelda Breath of the Wild. <laughs> Have you? If I had a Switch, I would. Um, that's a big bone of contention in the household is the lack of switch. <laughs> and my daughter, who's uh, th who's got a ninth birthday next week, kept saying, "Am I going to get a switch for my birthday?" We're like, "No, you're not." <laughs> just, just, just no. Not, not, not. Now. Maybe Christmas. Maybe Christmas. Hmm. Maybe. Got an Xbox last year. What, what can get this year? Yeah. Okay. More games. More games. More games. Yeah. To, oh, to be fair, we should probably get on to talking about the book. Okay. And I was yeah. thinking. I was going to go all the way back to the first edition and just say, like, uh, what inspired you to write a book in the first place on Game of Fish? Um, So to do that, you have to go back to the book before that, which was the simple introduction to gamification, uh, which was terrible, really badly written book. And it was 2012, and I'd written loads of blogs at that point because I was quite prolific in the first couple of years. And... I, I thought I'm going to put a full stop to this series of thoughts I'm having, and I'm going to put it all into one little sort of ebook and throw it up on on Amazon and see what happens. And at the time, there were only about two other gamification books on there. I think both were Gabe Zickerman's. Possibly Carl Cap had one out. And so it was it was reasonably popular, even though it was horrifically written uh, and had no coherence to it whatsoever. And still, I keep finding it being quoted in um, in research papers because. It had, it had one one little factoid in it about um, the origin of the word gamification from 2002, Nick Pelley. And it's been argued whether that's the real origin or not. But because Wikipedia at some point, someone had put it into Wikipedia that this was the origin of gamification. Mm -hmm. And it quoted back towards my book rather than to the original source that I quoted. So my book ends up in all kinds of research papers when they say, Nick Pelling created gamification. You're like, no, no, no. And my this this horrible book comes up. So a couple of years later, I thought, I need to do something a bit, bit, bit better than that because that was naff. And I was looking at how do you self-publish and I started looking at publishers and it was a bit of a ball late, to be honest. So I thought, right, I'm going to write something a bit better. I'm going to think about it. It's still going to be based on the blogs, but it's going to be a bit more coherent, have a bit more of a start, a middle, and an end, and have some kind of structure to it. So the first edition was exactly that. It was um, months and months and months of tearing apart old blogs and trying to make some of the frameworks I had fit together. Mm -hmm. um, and also, Gustavo has something to do with it down the line because he was doing a lot of work on my Hexad in his research. Um, and one of the issues that they were having was they can't reference it because it's a blog piece. So we thought, well, if we rewrite the blog as a paper and submit that to one of the Cheaplay things, and that gives you a referencing point, and Cheaplay turned it down because it was already a blog. So you couldn't reference the blog, but you also couldn't write a paper because the blog existed. And um, that was the point where I'd started writing the book or I was halfway through or something. He well, you know, one of the things you can do is just publish a book because once a book, once a book's out in the public domain, you can quote the book and reference it and it's yeah. accepted. 
or words to that effect. I thought, great, so that's what I'll do. Um, and uh, which is kind of why it got the odd name because I was feeling quite bitter at the time. And I was talking to my daughter about, oh, what should I call, I can't remember exactly what the conversation was, but um, she was talking about wanting to be a unicorn ninja or something. And I just thought, you know what, it doesn't matter what I call it. Um, but scientific papers will have to reference it with the proper name. So it became even ninja monkeys like to play because I just, there's this little sick part of me that loves seeing that. And these big scientific papers with loads of sort of, Edward Desi, Ryan, all quoted and stuff. And then even Ninja Monkeys like to play. Yes. <laughs> and there it is. <laughs> and so that was how the first edition got, got sort of written. That's cool. So who's the, who was the book aimed at? Who, who were you hoping would be the readers, apart from the academics referencing it? I, I'd love to say I was that, I planned that far ahead. The original one was just I wanted something out there that was better than what I had already. And really the target audience was the likes of you who already had an understanding of gamification uh, and just wanted some kind of uh, sort of almost a base of notes that they could refer back to. You know, it wasn't a book that was meant to be read start to finish. It was just like in a dip in, I want some advice on using Excel for gamification. Oh, there's a chapter on that, you know. So it was, it was more kind of almost a tabletop book for people who were in gamification already was the idea. Now you tell me you didn't have to read the whole thing. <sighs> oh, well, you know. But hey, the little ninja monkey kept you kept you entertained at least. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So, I mean, that was the ninja monkey, the new edition, yeah. the unicorn. Okay, yeah. Why did you feel the need for, and I'm going to call this the third edition of the book, because I feel like you updated it as well. Is that right? Uh, um, there, there might have been two versions of this. I can't, do you know, I honestly can't remember because I, there was some bits that changed because I had to change the way I was talking about game thinking. So there might be a different version with, I think there's a slightly newer version without the game thinking bit as focused, purely because um, I had a chat with Amy Jo Kim and although she was absolutely fine when we were using game thinking, I didn't want to sort of confuse the message that she was giving with some of the stuff that I was saying. So we kind of changed it to, I changed it to game based, um, game based solutions or something. So the second edition, I, I just had loads more stuff to say. And again, I, I kind of use books and things like that and big, big events to kind of put a full stop on certain trains of thought. And I mean, the book's probably about twice as thick as the original book. And there's a lot more stuff, not a lot more stuff about narratives in there, a lot more stuff about some of the, um, actually, but the biggest change is talking about how to write narratives properly and kind of small narratives and micro narratives. There is some more stuff on some of the kind of the, the philosophy behind it but there's a lot more practical stuff in here as well that i didn't include in the first one you know the first half of the original book was almost a philosophy lesson on play um and i was actually i was trying to get it published it was part of why a second edition or this bigger edition came out i thought i'm gonna I'm get this published and i was working with a publisher really closely to get it done um and they pulled out at the last minute and so i was left with what i thought was a much better version of the book and it was called something else for the publisher. They didn't want unicorns and ninjas and stuff. So it was a slightly more serious approach. But what it had was a much, much better structure to how the book worked and how you could you could read it from start to finish and kind of learn stuff as you went along. There, there was none of there were certain issues with the first book where I'd, I'd introduce a concept kind of at the beginning that I didn't explain till near the middle somewhere and things like that. So. Um, and it was just yeah. a, it's just a much better version of the content with some sort of updated ideas and a bit more polish to it in places as well yeah i think it flows really well and there's a nice you know the, the way you dive into the theories to make sure people understand them before we move on to the next bit it's very good thank you very much but on you know on a lighter question who does the artwork who who drew the ninja monkey and the unicorn ah oh, so the ninja monkey and the unicorn um you know funny enough it's a guy on fiverr Okay. So I was, um, I kind of mocked it up for myself and I thought, oh, do you know, what? I'm not a great artist. So all of the illustrations in the book were all just PowerPoint and done by me. And then I thought, oh, I want a decent cover for this. So I, I was looking on five and this guy had these really cool illustrations. And I just said, right, this is what I want. And created this monkey for me. And I thought that's amazing. Love that. And then it came to doing this version and I was kind of trying to work out Again, something silly. And it came back to that whole conversation with my daughter about ninjas and unicorns. And I thought, well, I haven't got a unicorn in there yet, so let's let's add a unicorn. And again, sent it to him, and he gave me this great little version of the the, the monkey riding the unicorn. So, uh, yeah, Fiverr's a great resource, actually. I was surprised how good this guy was. 
I like it. I, I was wondering if it was yet another string on your bow, like guitar playing, game design. No, or... I'm a horrific artist. I am dreadful okay. at art. <laughs> well, I'm in the same boat there, so that's fine. <laughs> I'm going to dive into some questions from my rereading of the book this week. Okay. I didn't know so my homework. Like... Christ, okay. Wait, hang on. I've got the book here. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, and I've just picked stuff that's of interest to me. All right. I've got to be fair. So uh, you've got a section on definitions, like most of these books have. You're the first other gamification practitioner I've found who actually likes um, Kevin Wehrbach's second definition, the process of making activities more game-like as gamification. And yeah. I was wondering, because I, that's my favorite for him, mm. so this is why it resonated. I was wondering why that one. So I did a lot of research on this. I mean, a, a lot of research on definitions. I mean, early on, I did a huge survey across all the experts at the time about what they thought. And it was really interesting to me that um, the, the the traditional one, you know, the game, game elements in non-game contexts, felt quite restrictive to me. That's a great definition. And if you're looking at pure gamification, no kind of fluffy edges. That's exactly what it is. It's take game elements, put them in non-game context. But I felt there was something missing from it. And I think game-like was the bit that got me because it occurred to me that a lot of what we were doing, you know, we weren't making games, especially then we weren't. And um, game-like seemed to fit that somehow. And I like the idea of process, the fact that it wasn't just a you didn't just suddenly come up with a game. There's a whole process of design that goes through and you have to go through a lot of iteration. So that just really resonated with me. And I kind of did what we all do. I borrowed from that. So I think my definition is something along the lines of creating game-like experiences with game elements and play or something. I think it's my current definition. And uh, engagement I, and stuff. Yeah, actually, I, I, I really like play as part of the definition as well because I think that uh, you know, game-like was really important to me. And then the second part for me is play because as you read the book, I spend a lot of time talking about play because I think it's something that as adults we're terrible at remembering to do and understanding what play really is. So, I, And a lot of the gamification that I see actually is play because it allows you to just go off and do little things that may or may not be relevant to what you were doing before, um, which kind of feels play-like to me. So, yeah, that was kind of why I just thought his that's, stuff was really good. That's the point of a game, isn't it? Is to get us into a state of play. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think, yeah, so I think the game like was, I just felt that was better than non game context and ele game elements. And I thought, well, a game like feels, feels better to me. Mm -hmm. And he had a lot of research behind it as well, to be fair to him. But yeah, that's very true. <laughs> it's nice to read. I like it as well because it's, it's just like an instruction to anyone in gamification. Look, mm. make your experiences more game like. Go. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's such a simple concept as well. Well, I mean, it's not simple to do, but the idea of, you know, if you wanted to, if you want to be gamified, it probably needs to be a bit game-like <laughs> in some way. In some way. I mean, I like how you're talking about play. In the book, you talk about playfulness versus gamefulness. I found yeah. that really interesting. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. So when you look at the kind of classic definitions of play and games, Games differ because they have a fixed rule set usually. So there's there's kind of guidelines as what you can and can't do. So the idea, for instance, football, you know, playing with a ball, two children kicking a ball around and just having fun with it and doing tricks and stuff, that's just play. As soon as you say, right, one of you needs to try and get it into that pair of jumpers, the other one needs to get into that pair of jumpers, you start creating a game. So when we're looking at gamification, it's usually more gameful because there's usually a set process you're trying to get somebody through. There's a series of events they have to go through. There are challenges, whatever. So it feels gameful, whereas playful was more around almost the extras around it. So Easter eggs. There's no point to having an Easter egg, but it's fun to go and find them. You know, you'll see that I love doing that in games, just kind of wandering around and seeing what I can find that maybe the, pro the developers are just left there for fun. Um, I think if you go to my my website and you do the um, the Konami cheat code, you'll get a game pops up. So things like that, just because I know that almost no one will ever do it, but I know it's there and that I find playful and fun. And there's no reason for it to be there other than it's playful. So I kind of, I always put things on, in the book, I put things on a scale of playful to gameful, mm -hmm. game versus play, and start talking about like gameful games, playful games, because, you know, Minecraft is kind of a play, is playful play because there's no real 
reason to do it. And then you get other games which are playful games because it's mostly play, but there are some rules that come around with it, that kind of stuff. So to me, it's a really interesting distinction. So do you think there's a balance we need to find when we're designing our gamification between the playful and the gameful? Uh, yeah, um, I think most gamification needs to be more gameful yeah, it, because there needs to be a there's, like, there's a reason to be doing it. There's an end point to the process you're undertaking, um, and then you need a little bit of playfulness around it, just because it just makes it a bit more interesting to people. You know, if we we sat doing mandatory training, which we all have to do from time to time, got to do the risk awareness training. Having something playful in the background that maybe only three people notice, like Mario runs across in the background, there's no no benefit to that, but it just makes you go, oh, that was fun, and it just refocuses you slightly. So I think that element of playfulness, not even just play itself, just that kind of almost silliness sometimes can be really important. I mean, I, I'm shocked you say there's no benefit to it, because actually what you're saying is it... So it brings, right. more, it brings back your attention, things like that. So yeah, what you're so saying is, it's not from point of view, there's no directly related benefit. Yeah, it's not directly linked to the content or to the learning at the end of the content, but it, it's more about that kind of yeah. So when I talk about the design intent, you know, the design intent of a gamified learning solution is to learn the content. Uh, the playful intent could be to have is to have fun during that process. So. It has benefit to the end user, but it's not necessarily beneficial to the content you're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. Not long after that, I read a whole chapter in here on the uh, ethics of gamification use. This is something I know you've always been keen on, and the co uh, gamification code of ethics and so on. Um, how do you feel the industry is doing in terms of its ethics? I mean, <laughs> as well as any industry, I think. Um, it's a really difficult thing to, to nail. Um, and it came up in conversation the other day, I think, um, on Professor, uh, Professor Game's podcast. Someone was talking about ethics and they had, they had raised my, my name at some point. And I was thinking about it recently. And, you know, the key to it is, the key to all ethics when it comes to gamification is you're not coercing people to do things that aren't beneficial to them in some way. I think, yeah, that originally there was this big sort of fear that gamification was like hypnosis, that by, by doing something in gamification, I could coerce you into behaving like a chicken. And I think that was the case in some instances. There were definitely, there was definitely, and this still is, there's definitely gamification, which is specifically designed to make you do more of something that probably isn't great for you. And I remember, I think one of the gamifiers meet up, we had a big conversation about using gamification in the gambling industry. Try, trying to make gambling more sticky or more addictive. Um, and I know we all had a bit of a moment on that one where we're like, mm, that that seems maybe that might be a bit close to the knuckle. Um, and I think that changed. They were starting to look at using gamification actually to do the opposite, to help people educate themselves around when to stop, which I thought was a great step. So I think Ethics is vital. I think as an as a kind of an industry, we're getting better at it. I think we're more aware of it because it's coming up everywhere. You know, you start looking at you know, Cambridge Analytica and stuff like that, where they've used all this data. And we're talking about whenever we talk about gamification, we talk about these huge data sets that we use to analyze behavior. And that's quite scary. Yeah. Um, and I think most people I know in the industry <laughs> use it wisely. You know, their great power comes great responsibility. You know. Uh, but I don't. I still think that it's not a hot enough topic yet. It will be, but it's going to take. It's unfortunately, it's one of those things that will take a Cambridge Analytica type moment where everyone goes, "Oh, we should think about this." And unfortunately, that'll be a little bit too late for the industry because that's when people will really start going, "Oh, they used rewards and they used kind of gamification." Oh no, no, that's really bad. So if we talk about it now, at least we're prepared for it not happening in the future. Yeah, although I mean, I think it, it's happening because I'm aware of a number of political campaigns that are doing quite a lot of gamification. Yeah, campaigns. and and one of the key things they're after is data through that. Exactly, you know, fill fill this in and have a chance of winning a pen. Um, you know, it's terrible, terrible gamification, but you're seeing a lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you get a lot. Of, you you get a lot of the uh, Buzzfeedy style stuff. Oh, we'll give you a, give you all these results about what superhero you are, and actually what they're doing is collecting reams of data about your behaviour. 
but it feels game like so you don't care so there are some instances where it isn't it isn't right still but then so i can't just talk about it came across one recently where it was more like get you to play in a game and see the results in the future as it were of the policies of the politician you'd be voting mm. for yeah so so you'd then be like and of course that's a completely biased what it might look like in the future approach you could you know and i thought yeah. that's quite interesting quite, quite an interesting set of modeling going on there <laughs> yeah so do you think this weird year we're in will change anything around the ethics of the industry or gamification um, I think ethics, probably not, um, although I think ethics is, in general, in society, is a big topic right now. You know, we have, without going too far into politics, it could be said there are leaders of certain countries at the moment who their ethics may be dubious, and there are lots of countries that this could be said of. And um, I think so ethics is now probably quite a hot topic for people. Um, thinking about ethics, <laughs> and I think also not just ethics but morals. I think before you even get to the ethics side of things, you know, before you get a written set of statements, mm -hmm. it's just human morals, morality. I think are questioning. We're beginning to question that a lot more. I think for the gamification industry, what's going to be interesting is when you look at sort of HR, for instance. Now's not a great time to go to a, an HR organization and say, you know, are you interested in gamification and engagement for employees? Because they're currently battling to keep employees employed, let alone sort of is employment engaging right now? It's just, are you employed? Can we help you in some way to pay your bills? I think when we come out of this is when we're going to need so much more of it because we're going to need to re-educate people. We're going to need to kind of like, this, I hate the phrase, new normal. People are going to need to kind of know how to work outside of kind of just being in the office lots of organizations are going to be doing this remotely from now on they're going to kind of give it more more time more balance to working from home um, so education is going to become much more remote so using gamification we know is hugely beneficial for, for education i think um policy making people are going to need to have a lot more guidance around that and i think a lot of gamification can can help with the guidance around that just for almost play testing policies almost like you're saying there before you know will will this work how does this fly well let's model it and try and actually play the game of policy um i think we're going to see yeah. it that's interesting because i've got a question i was going to get you later which is like you talk about modeling for gamification yeah. in your practical hearts but you don't mention play testing at all as far as I can see, so like, how important to you is is the modelling aspect, and is is the fact there's not really playtesting mentioned in the design methodology because of budgets or no? Do you know what it is? It, it that's an interesting point actually. I don't know if I specifically have a thing on playtesting, and that might be a chapter for an update. Yeah, um, do you know what? That's what that's next week's blog. That's that sorted yeah. now. Um, it is part of the iterative process. And I think I kind of, I think it's almost in the back of my mind, it's just implied in just testing stuff and, and, and just iterating through it. Because if you, as you well know, if you're working with an organization, play testing, you almost have to sneak in because it seems like a time drawer. It seems like a money sink because there's a lot of, Oh, well, we just need to just check it one more time. We just need to check it one more time. We found a bug here. We need to te test that. We just need to test this little bit. We need 50 people to test this little bit. And I think when you're looking at kind of an agile work process, a lot of that testing is done as you develop and as you kind of, you're working with the client really closely. Um, you often test stuff as you're going along. So it might be why it's not as sort of highlighted as, as something that needs to be done. Yes, I do a lot of play testing. Um, I don't always have a large number of people to be able to play test with. It's part of my problem in industry. There's, there's not, yeah. you don't have that big vast pool. But what you do tend to do is we'll release stuff to a small group. So, we'll, we'll, so we'll work with the client. We'll work with whoever we can to get it to a point where it's we we're pretty sure it's viable. Then you'll give it to a larger group and let them go through it and find all the problems with it. And you look at. I mean, you even look at large, massive kind of multi-million dollar games. That's exactly what they do. That's why you get day one patches. That's why you get, yeah. you know, they, why you can't turn your PS4 on without it updating for six hours first. Because 
people just haven't got the time anymore to do proper play testing. I think. So, so would you yeah. say the modeling is like a phase you can do before the play testing to try and capture as much of that as possible before you even release that? Yeah, I mean, I'll try and make sure that I understand that mechanics will work, even even in theory, before I start building anything. You know, reward systems, combinations of mechanics, whatever it might be, uh, just to make sure that. Um, so, a good example. You know that machinations tool that I talk about from time to time. Yeah. It's just been re-released. Um, I used to use that all the time to model uh, economies. So how quickly will somebody get to the end of this if they are just churning through it? So you would kind of create all the levels, all the, all the um, how, how many points it took to get to a level, prizes, whatever it might be. Hit go and just watch how long it's going to take and you kind of estimate how many days certain things would take. Yeah. And there are some, plat- there are some tools I'll be making you go, oh, they could actually complete the whole thing in less than three hours. Excellent. Let's change that entire process. <laughs> you know, so that kind of stuff. And then doing it in Excel, I use it a lot to understand how, um, again, how quickly people get through things, how valid some things are, how valued some things might be. Mm-hmm. Understanding people and what kind of groups are going to be using it to try and see well, will this group of mechanics necessarily hit the right mark with this group of people? And then, so there's a lot more almost a lot more work goes into the research up front so that by the time you get to building it there you're almost looking at bugs rather than does this work because you kind of because the build process is so integrated with the research with working with the clients by the time you're at the end of that process you'd have to have gotten really wrong early on for the end product to not not be good that makes sense and then you're almost in just the Yes, there are certain little bits that maybe don't hit the right marks. That, but again, you're you're iterating that all the time. So yeah, that's interesting. I, I hadn't thought about the fact that I hadn't specifically spoken about playtesting. Hmm. <laughs> I had to go back through and go. Did I just blink and miss it? No, no, you didn't. It's, it's just fine. Uh, it's just implied in implied in iterative design. I think that you test yeah. as you go along. So yeah, that's a good. Point. Know, it's, it's it's interesting because lots of other people in game education talk quite a lot about playtesting. And then there it was, not there. No. Um, I mean, on the other side, yeah, you've got a whole chapter dedicated to flow theory, yeah, <laughs> which is more than most people would go into. So I'm interested in a couple of things there. One is uh, what gets you into a state of flow? Okay, just on a personal note, um, music is the big one. Um, playing music. I uh, so I play in a I play in a band now, and there'll be times where we're in the studio and we're just practicing and time just stops. You know, I'm just in the moment singing. Big one for that is creep. There's a particular bit at the end of creep where it gets very high and that's quite a strain for me. And there are times where <laughs> where that sort of challenge and skill just meet that perfect moment where I hit that note and I hold it for a while and then completely forget to play the rest of the song. <laughs> <laughs> because I because just hit that state perfectly and uh, everything else is disappearing. The guys are waiting for me to hit the next chord. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so music does it. Games do it. Spending time with the kids as well, just playing with the kids can, can hit that point where... Do you know, I thought, I thought you were going to say writing blog posts and things like that because you do so many of them. Do you know, I hate writing. I genuinely yeah. hate writing because I'm dyslexic. So writing is quite a struggle for me. So I'm always in that frustration phase when I'm writing. I do it because I need to get ideas out of my head to make room for other stuff. I'm like Homer Simpson. If if I have to cram one more idea in, I think I'm going to lose the name of my children out the other side somewhere. So I just thought it's almost like a flow. If I've got an idea, let's write about it. So it's there for me to remember later. I don't have to remember it. (laughs) It's very open diary. (laughs) So here's my question for you. Right, We we all in gamification talk about flow as a really good state to get, Mm -hmm. you know, we're aiming for. Uh, what would you say that have you seen a good example of flow in a gamified experience? No. What was that? Not no, yet? Never. Um, because, and I, I allude to this in the book as well, actually. Um, when we're talking about flow and gamification, with the greatest respect to all of us, we're not talking about flow. What we're talking about is balancing challenge and skills. So when you are, and it all goes back to the art of game design from Jesse Shell, where that's where that diagram comes where you've got the two axis and the kind of the flow channel. If you look at the original flow image, there's a lot more to it. You know, flow is this real sort of state at the top, which is quite rare to hit. 
Um, so when we're talking about it, we're often talking about how do you balance skill and challenge properly. And I've seen lots of of lots of gamified experiences that challenge the challenge and the skill are nicely balanced. Um, they're usually more game like than kind of traditional gamification mode. Mm -hmm. So um, I used to judge a lot of um, uh, serious games for the conference in America. And there are some games there, especially kind of military training games, where you would hit that state quite nicely because it was like playing a real game, but you're learning skills as you go along. I think I see lots of gamified experiences where challenge and skill are matched very nicely, but I wouldn't say I enter that moment of kind of flow because it's just something missing from it. There's that there's just that magic dust that we that in gamification can be quite hard to sprinkle over what is essentially usually quite a dull experience that you are trying mm -hmm. to improve. And I think one of, the, one of the things that I often say to people is, you know, gamification, isn't that's a goal. You want to work towards that. If you don't work towards it, there's no point in doing it. But actually, sometimes what you're really trying to do is just make something less rubbish to experience. And that's a huge win for most people because they'll remember that it was better than just reading a PDF and doing a quiz. But no, I, I can't think of a pure gamified system where at the end of it, I've thought, wow, you know, time stood still for me. I've done through plenty where I thought that was a lot better than it could have been, actually. That, that, okay. that was so much, about, so much of, of a better experience. So can we get there? Is it something we should still be aiming for? Absolutely. I think right. and as, as we start delving further into kind of more game-like experiences, we're going to hit it more regularly. You know, people are using virtual worlds. They're using virtual reality to do this stuff. And I think... Um, Okay, let's step back actually. So virtual reality, the reason I'm stepping back is there was one experience I did recently, which I suppose you could call gamification, but it was a real 3D virtual environment series game. So we'll, we'll kind of hijack it as gamification. And I was at uh, um, the EdTech conference in London. It was a virtual reality experience where I was just, it was just about empathy and understanding how it felt to be the other end of a conversation you had just had with somebody about their work ethics and kind of, oh, you know, you're not working hard enough. And then it put you in the other, and I totally forgot what was going on around me. Whether that was flow or immersion, which were also quite difficult mm. to kind of separate sometimes, that was one of those experiences where I learned a lot and completely forgot about everything around me because I was so immersed in it. And there was a lot to think about. There was just enough challenge, just enough skill needed. So maybe that was as close as I've got to it in something you could claim was gamification yeah okay that's interesting because also in uh in the book you talk about the gamification user journey mm. and you know the player journey it's sometimes called and i noticed that you renamed the habit building or scaffolding phase to immersion yes so why is that because for me that was what i was designing more often what i do design is i try and because i know that with amy um She's got something very similar now in there. So I know she's changed the way her model works slightly to have that kind of immersion loop, as I would call it. Um, mm -hmm. And it just, for me, it was, uh, I felt that you needed to immerse people in the experience. And there was a phase where you probably were churning a little bit. In most experiences, most games, most gamified experiences, there's that, there's that moment in the middle where you're immersed in what you're doing and you're probably just churning through the same, the same motions over and over again. Yeah. Uh, grinding in games essentially and I just felt that, that that for me felt like a better thing than habit form because really in gamification when you're talking about sort of educational games there isn't a habit being formed it's just going through the motions getting immersed in the learning and coming out the other side if you're talking about kind of a fit bit then yeah you'd, you that immersion and that habit building are the same thing really it's kind of what's what you're trying to do is form those habits but to get there you're immersing yourself in the experience of challenging your friends and that kind of stuff so that was where immersion came from that's why i felt that fit my way of building stuff better that's interesting i, I quite like the habit building because it focuses me on the behavior change yeah that I want to absolutely make. and i always think if you've done a really good gamified experience then eventually you could take away the gamification and the habit has been formed that would be a good test i think that's exactly how we should be designing you know the totally and that was kind of the, the the key to when I was talking about player journeys, that was always kind of what I was aiming for is, you know, you talk about all the, the intrinsic motivations, you use the, the extrinsic stuff to kind of get them through the first kind of onboarding phase and all that stuff. 
but eventually you have to remove it because you can't just keep throwing more stuff at them to keep them engaged if they aren't if they aren't using the whatever it is the products or the education you know at some point you can't just keep holding their hand and saying here's a suite for doing it here's a suite for doing it is you know think about any kind of process training a dog you can't just keep giving them rewards if they sit they have to eventually just sit <laughs> Very Pavlovian, I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm running out of time for all my questions for this session. But I mean, I noticed there's a, a point from uh, the chat about um, age differences and getting the interest of older groups rather than youth. And it occurs to me, you're pretty famous for the user types hexad. <laughs> thousands, how many thousands of people have now been oh, about 30, you know, taking it? It's quite, quite a yeah. lot now. So what insights have you been able to draw and are there any trends you're seeing appear? Yes, I can say yes to that one because there is uh, the one that interested me most. So there's, there's a bit of a gender difference. Um, you find more and it's not a, it's not a massive, massive difference in the, in the survey. But there is a there is a difference um, more towards kind of the socialized uh, um, philanthropy side of things. I've like been being nice to people and social with people that slightly more women than men tend to focus around that area. Not as many as you might expect, but there is definitely a trend. The bigger one for me was age, was the fascinating one, because the younger participants were much more interested in kind of learning and rewards, so player and achiever, and the older generations were much more around philanthropy. Uh, and what I found fascinating was in the middle, somewhere free spirit dipped, and it was kind of almost the career path of kind of they're young and eager to learn and get what they can, and they're taking everything they can. And then slowly their spirit is taken away from them as they <laughs> they go through their career. And they come out the other side and they're kind of a bit more free-spirited again, but they've got much more knowledge to give back to people. That was my kind of mental journey. There's a lot more to it than that. But, yeah, definitely um, the older generations tend towards being in a position they can give back more. And I think that's, that's just experience. There comes a the point where they're, le they're learning a lot less and they're giving back a lot more, they're teaching a lot more. Whereas the younger generations are kind of hungry for knowledge. They're much more kind of used to that, do something, get something straight away um, mentality. So to engage both, you need to include something where it's kind of that instant gratification, but also something where there's that ability to give back into the system. Oh, that's fantastic. Good, good insight into where we're going as well, trends-wise. Mm. I think it makes sense. It does. Well. When you think I love about it when it the trend actually matches and it makes sense. You're like, yeah. oh, finally, it's human rationality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I've got a bunch of questions I could ask, but I'm going to end on one more, which is just because um, I'm interested in this. Is there a game type or genre that you love uh, and that you love to use in your work, but you've not had a chance to do yet? What would that be? I would love to use more of a civilization style game in a big project. Uh, so that whole resource management side of things. Because I've done the first person now. That was the kind of stuff I was doing with students. I got got first person into a game into a gamified experience. So I think resource management because it just hits every single tick on our sort of gamification and greatness checklist of things. You know, it has all the kind of the strategy because one of the things that gamification often misses is strategy because it's usually a fairly black and white, here's what I've got to achieve. And I think adding strategy into it where there are outcomes that maybe even the designer doesn't understand could happen are fascinating to me. That whole, um, you know, the, the dynamics of stuff happening that you aren't expecting. So I think, yeah, strategy games like Civilization, uh, Command and Conquer, where it's kind of real-time yeah. strategy games, all that kind of stuff. I'd love to get into, into a project like full-on, this is a strategy game. <laughs> You've got me there. Oh, that's my favourite game of all time, of Civilization. So I just got Civilization Six the other day off uh, Epic for free, so I was like, yes, <laughs> start that again. Well, if you, I mean, what, what do you think we could use it for in a gamified way? Without it straying too much into a simulation, that's my worry with strategy. Yeah, I think that's the problem. A lot of it, a lot of it will be in modelling kind of behaviour, politics. You want to talk about modelling policies that you yeah. see it quite well. But I think even just simple bits of the strategy of um, you know, if you're even when it's just around the periphery of the learning, something you're doing allows you to then start creating a world around it. So if you think about uh, Zombies Run. The, the mm -hmm. fun element that you got from Zombies Run was being able to create your city. 
and you had to have a bit of strategy about do I do I want the infirmary here? Do I want a fence here? And you got all of the you got all of the money to do that from running and collecting stuff as you did your running. So sometimes it could just be that interesting thing that you are able to do at the end of learning and it's your reward. I think we could use the strategy sometimes a bit more in face-to-face -face learning. So kind of card games with strategy because sometimes you can really learn how to solve situations by learning strategies around how other people have solved them. So there's a lot we could do with it, but I agree with you. I think the most obvious uses are going to stray into simulation, which is fine. But um, I, I, yeah, I'd like to, anyone who's got ideas on how we can get strategy games into learning more would be just genius, I think. That sounds like a great idea for a meetup itself. It does. How can we use strategy, in, strategy games in learning more? Let's do that. All right. I, I'm going to wrap things up here. I want to say thank you so much for being uh, so open and informative sure. with your answers. Um, normally, I would give time for questions from the audience, but I've, you know, I've been asking them as they've come in, so that's cool. Um, Twit check. Where can people get a hold of a copy of the book, and how can they best get in touch with you? So the book is not backwards when you buy it. It's just on my camera. It seems to be backwards. Um, it's fine. How is it right for you? It's a mirror to yeah. me. So you can get this on Amazon uh, in most countries. Uh, you can also get a PDF version off my website, gamify.uk, um, which also you get the book, you get the framework worksheet booklet, and you get principal versions of all my cards that you can use for workshops. Um, and I don't think this version is available on iBooks on iTunes. I think there's an old version on iTunes, so don't go there to get it. The best place is Amazon to get either a print copy or an ebook. Uh, although if you go to my website, I get more of the profits. <laughs> there you go. go but that's only website. that's only digital. You've got a print version on Amazon. All right. Virtual round of applause for Angie. Thank you very much. You've been great. Cheers, Pete. All right. I'll send everyone back to the tables now for have a chat. Okay. Cool.